Next speaker is Dr. Pat Chow Fraser. Uh, Dr. Fraser is a, a professor of biology and director of the life sciences at McMaster University. Her career in freshwater ecology started in 1978 following her bachelor in biology at the University of Waterloo, where she remained to complete her master in biology again and receive her PhD in zoology from University of Toronto. Her main research interest is in uh, influence of the human impacts on the health of aquatic systems. Okay, okay. thank you very okay. much. Um, sorry for this uh, confusion with the laptop and everything. Um, it's, um, it's my pleasure to be here and we're gonna, uh, actually it was quite nice that Chris came before me because he sort of set things up a little bit uh, with respect to the why I did what I did um, 10 years after we started with the Coots Paradise. Um, so the first thing I'd like to do is just um, get you guys organized in terms of what coastal wetlands in the Laurentian Great Lakes. Um, these include all five Great Lakes as well as the connecting channels. Um, and one of the things that, uh, there are a lot of different different services that wetlands provide, but for the coastal marshes that I'm looking at, I'm looking specifically at the habitat that it provides for a large number of species. Um, and so wetlands in the settled areas of the Great Lakes, in particular Lakes Erie in Ontario and Michigan, um, have been degraded and both by agricultural and urban activities. And, and not surprisingly, farming is one of the major things that, that have occurred to make these changes. Uh, so what you see here is um, the proportion of agriculture from the least in green to the most is that dark brown. You can see that Lake Erie and Lake Ontario have a lot of the agricultural input and most of it is actually in the form of phosphorus and total suspended solids in the, in the runoff. Uh, but there are also lots of inputs from urban settings and in a lot of mixed watersheds such as Coots Paradise, which Chris has already mentioned, there are also um, urban agricultural as well as um, just um, non-point non source. Um, so Coots Paradise as described is a drowned river mouth. And to see it now, you would never know that it's a drowned river mouth because the hydrology has changed so much. They've actually dredged, you can see the Desjardins Canal, uh, which is dredged to connect the, the uh, town of Dundas, which was actually a lot more prosperous uh, back in the 1800s than the town of Hamilton. And so the shipping was a really big part of it and the canal was, dredged primarily to create a faster flow um, of, of goods for navigation. Um, and so there is the altered hydrology. So instead of flowing through Grindstone Creek, it now flows directly out from Coots Paradise to, to Hamilton Harbor. Um, the altered land use in the watershed um, has resulted in only 30% of it being forested and a lot of those trees were removed, uh, the, the primary forests were removed for shipbuilding. So what we have now is only about 30% of that. Um, and then on top of that, we've had sewage entering the marsh uh, as a receiving body since about 1919. So we first, for the first 60 years or so, it was primary um, just with big things uh, filtered out. And then there was a secondary treatment, and then finally, by 1987, there was tertiary treatment. But as you know now, that uh, a lot of that sediment still has a lot of legacy phosphorus in it. Um, and then the thing that everybody likes to hate, which is the common carp, and, um, and I'll show you that um, they are, I think, unfairly blamed for a lot of the problems, but they're pretty much the only thing that we could do anything about very quickly. Um, and on top of all of that, the emergent vegetation has also been declining as a result of high water levels, as I, I will show you. It decreased pretty much steadily from about 85% in the 1930s to 
just about 10% in the 1990s when I started working on it. And it's rebounded a little bit because water levels has, has come back up. And then on top of that, because of all of these changes, there's also been a lot of changes to the uh, colonization of exotic species. Um, in plants here, we, we have now the common reed, and we have lots and lots of managrass. And the species of, of cattails that we have is also the hybrid, which is the, uh, the putative Glauca species. So here you have, uh, you can see the water levels. This is the water levels of Lake Ontario. Um, the, the one thing about coastal marshes is that these, uh, the, the water levels of the large lakes flood in, and so they're very, very highly affected by them. So you can see here that um, from about 1960 on, the water level of Lake Ontario has been regulated, mainly for uh, hydroelectricity and, and navigation. Um, and so you can see that where we have, we used to have much lower water levels, those lows are not present anymore after the regulation. We still have some lows. Uh, in particular, you can see that since we have undergone a very, very high water period, it's now gradually becoming less and less so. In fact, in 1999, which is right here, um, it was the lowest water levels that we've had. Now this low water level coincides with all the other Great Lakes, and so most people think it is climate change induced. Now the, the, the thing about 1999 is that that was also a couple of years after the restoration actually got implemented. So there's a lot of things here that's being wrapped up. Um, so we know that the emergent vegetation is highly affected by inundation. We have, in low water levels, not a lot of inundated areas. So the inundated area is that blue area here, which is um, just probably too deep for the emergent vegetation to grow. So you can see that in low water levels is when you would expect to see a lot more emergent vegetation. And in fact, that is the case. As you, if you take a series of aerial photos and then you, you uh, relate that cover of emergent vegetation to area that's inundated or the water level, you get a decrease in emergent vegetation. So pretty much most of what we see in terms of the emergent cover is explained by the water levels. Um, and you can see here photos comparing 1949 to 1985. Uh, you can see that the residual marsh, um, not everything is lost at equally throughout the, the wetland. There are residual areas where the marshes are, are still uh, relatively good, um, but there's a lot of here, which is a deeper area here, this is where most of it has been lost. It's important to think about this because in the restoration in 1991, when I became uh, involved with it, there was uh, the, the main, the main um, plan, the main approach, was to, to treat the entire marsh as one system. And so it was a, a large uh, carp removal. But there are some of us that actually still thought that the best way to restore this was to go into the areas where they were residual and work from there through planting and, and um, maybe some, um, some of the sedament uh, resculpturing. Um, you can see here that this is the kind of typical chocolate brown that we see after a storm in Coots Paradise in the, in the uh, summertime. Um, you, you, this is also, the other problem is that this is the direction of the prevailing wind. So the wind actually resuspends a lot of that sediment and accounts for about 30%. The carp itself also accounts for about roughly 30 or 40% of it. And then you have also the, the streams that are highly channelized, very, very flashy because of a lot of, of uh, surface areas. Uh, um, because of, of um, the, the surface area being so, so conducive to the flashiness. The, so it has large fetch, um, high sediment loading, 
So when there is high water, uh, when there's high water turbidity, the the submergent species will become less diverse, and in fact, eventually they just stop growing. So we know that from historic documents that when water turbidities were more in line with what we see in reference conditions about zero to five uh, NTUs, we would have a lot more diverse species. But now with this chocolate brown, we just simply get one or two species. So um, at the end of doing about five or six years of work, we were able to put together a conceptual model of how the wetland became degraded. And so basically, when there was low water levels, there was a lot of emergent vegetation which was able to filter out that sediment, and that led to higher submergent vegetation, which is really good habitat for those uh, piscivores, the, the, the fish that eat other fish, which then kept the, uh, the, the planktivores under control, which releases the, gra the, uh, releases the predation on those grazers, which then led us to a low water, uh, a low turbidity. When we have a degraded state, high water levels took care of a lot of the emergent vegetation, so there was much less filtering. And then on top of that, we had the common carp, which was going in there, and through its feeding and its by its spawning, was <coughs> redistributing the, the sediment into the water. So we had a high water turbidity for the last probably 60 years or so losing the submergence, losing habitat for the piscivores like pike, um, leading to high planktivores, and then consequently we, we don't have a lot of those grazers anymore to eat the algae. And so that all together created a sort of a downward spiral which keeps coots in its constant uh, turbidity and low, um, and, and, and low um, emergent and submergent vegetation. So really, the, the, the restoration that we had was, as I mentioned, the removal of common carp. And this was done through the creation of uh, the so-called Coots Paradise Fishway. The fishway is manually operated, and I really don't have time to really mention t too much of this, of how it works, but the fish come in during the springtime, and they will have to, uh, when they go through these baskets, they're picked up, and then they're manually sorted, and the fish, uh, the fish that are good, i.e. anything except carp, will be allowed to get in to the other side, and then the carp will return back to the... Um, so following the fishway, which was in 1997, so it's two years before that low, low water year we had, the uh, species of native fish did definitely increase. The water turbidity also was reduced as predicted. We had done a series of experiments that predicted that when you remove the carp, it would take care of about a third. So that's about 30. Now, in the areas where we had residual marsh, it was a lot better. So we, we were reaching about 60%. But there was no significant improvement in nutrients. And we now know why. It's because it's being, uh, the, the legacy phosphorus is coming back out all the time. Um, and then in the year 2000, after spending 10 years of my life and a lot of other people's lives on this, we wanted to see really how much benefit we had, we had gained. Um, how much did the marsh improve? And it, we thought that it might be naively for us to just go out and get somebody's indicators and then just, you know, one year later come up with something. No such thing. Um, it, there was no specific index that we could use for coastal marshes in the Great Lakes. And so we then started a program of going out to wetlands to, uh, uh, we ended up visiting over 200 wetlands in order to get the full range of conditions that we wanted. So we, the, the main thing is that when developing these indices, we had to make sure that we had the reference. So those things that wouldn't be uh, that are not being degraded, the how, how they would be normally without the agriculture and urban, as well as um, all of the degraded sites. Then we use multivariate statistics to rank the wetlands according to their conditions. And of course the things that, in terms of water quality, are these primary nutrients, suspended solids, chlorophyll, uh, conductivity. But we also wanted to sample for the fish and the plants because we knew that very few of the agencies can actually use, have the capability 
to use the uh, water quality information. Um, it, actually, that's not true. Most of the agencies can do it, but they don't like it. And so they actually prefer to go after the fish. And uh, I won't name the agency, but I think you all know which that one is. Um, so the water quality uh, tests uh, that we would run would be run simultaneously with whatever we, were, uh, we would like to, to uh, use as the biotic indices. In this case, the fish were, were all sampled, surveyed with paired fike nets set overnight. The fish were all counted, measured, and then released. And then the plants were all surveyed with the standardized protocol. And again, if anybody is interested in that, uh, I can refer you to, to our papers. Uh, so the, the development of the water quality index uh, was, was my attempt to try and see if there's something that we could do multivariately that would take the benefits of all of those parameters. Now, we sampled 21 different water quality and sediment parameters, but out of those, only 12 were emergent, uh, were emerged as being important and a significant contribution. Um, and so within this, we knew that it was a pretty good model, about 76% uh, of that were explained by the first four axes. So we had 146 wetland years that represented the range of conditions, and uh, we put it into a principal components analysis. And so this first axis is really the, the uh, the axis that, that ranks wetlands from the most degraded to the, the least degraded. The, the most degraded, no surprise, high, high total phosphorus, TN, high turbidity. The undisturbed sites with very, very low. Um, and then the other axis was actually more of a geographic axis, which separated Lake Superior sites from the warmer Georgian Bay sites. Now, it's, it turns out the, the warmer Georgian Bay sites had to be treated almost separately um, later on because it, they were pretty much the only sites that had a consistently uh, different geomorphology in terms of having the shield um, as the basic, the bedrock, as well as being mostly um, <coughs> lac uh, lacustrine type rather than riverine. So, it turned out that uh, the water quality index continued to be one of the better ones that we can use. The, the scores range from a plus three to a minus three. And you can see here some of the photos that show you a, a pristine wetland um, that is a 2.5. This is a minus 2.5, which is a, a very degraded site of Lake Erie. Okay, so you can take a score from each one of these wetlands and uh, rank them. And this is what this is. This is a simply a histogram. Each one of these colors represent a, a bay or a lake. Um, and what I want to show you here is that um, Cooch Paradise started off here in the very highly degraded site before 1994, before the restoration. The year after, following 1998, it went up a little bit, but still not into the, the very degraded. Uh, by the time we went into 2001, which is when I started to uh, report on all of these papers in publication, it had gone into sort of inching into the moderately degraded. So after spending millions of dollars um, I would say probably approaching $5 million, we moved it up to, you know, very degraded. <laughs> um, but we, we continue, it's, it's almost like a, a, a bad, you know, addiction for me. I have to keep going back to Coots every so often. <laughs> uh, and so a student uh, went in there in 2010 and, and collected more information. And you can see here again, uh, you know, it, it is still in a very, very degraded state, mostly because of that legacy and also because it's basically just wide open and you have a lot of wind uh, disruption. Now, if you were to uh, put all of this information uh, uh, collect all the information around the entire basin of, of all five Great Lakes, you can see that it really mirrors. A lot of the, the sites that we consider to be highly degraded are mirroring those inputs from agriculture. 
And so that's not really, this is not rocket science. I mean, it, I think we all knew that. It's just that I had to go ahead and do it and spend eight years doing this to, <laughs> to prove to people that it is. Um, and we can also see that on a, on a lake by lake basis, base, basin by basin basis, you can now do a five year, 10 year, um, you know, rep retrospective and just compare how things have changed. Now the water quality index is, uh, uh, it is not a great, it's not the greatest fit, but it is a significant relation to the proportion of altered land. Uh, and you can see here that with the Coots Paradise, you know, inching back up to where you would expect it to be if that amount of land is, is altered. So again, showing you that there's only so much you can improve because if you don't change the entire watershed, you're not gonna make much uh, improvements. Um, now, in terms of, as I said, there are agencies out there that don't want to, to uh, look at water quality, so you have to give them something else. And so what we did was we took our water quality information and what fish we have and developed what we called the WFI, the Wetland Fish Index, and the, water, the Wetland Macrophyte Index. And so basically that takes uh, into consideration that most species um, can fit into one of these along an environmental gradient where you would have um, species that are most disturbed would be, would be highest in, uh, in this end. So basically, we would see a distribution that would indicate whether or not it is tolerant of environmental uh, to the degradation and also how how precise is it? So for instance, we have generalist species that are actually found in a whole lot of different uh, environmental conditions. So we apply this formula and where it's simple enough to just put in the species presence or absence, um, you can also put in abundance if you want. Uh, so we have different formulas for that. And I just wanted to show you here that you can in fact uh, reflect using the WFI and the WNI, what the, what the WQI scores re, uh, tell you about the different lakes. Um, however, it is, it is true that in general, the water quality index, because that is what we're actually using to, uh, as a, uh, the, the fish and the plants are using it as a surrogate of what the water quality conditions are, it is much better to use the water quality index. And in particular, um, in the Georgian Bay area, where you can see here, most of the sites are still really, really great quality. Uh, you can also see that in Georgian Bay, there is hardly any uh, really land use impacts. So really, what we have there are not necessarily the, the, the land use impacts, but changes in terms of road density. And we do have, we have, we've conducted studies to show that if you look at the road densities and regress that against the water quality index, you can see that if you have the log of the road density along this axis, and zero being the score that means that it's not a degraded wetland, if you go all the way there and extrapolate, you're really talking about uh, a threshold of one uh, of 14 meters per hectare. So that's how much, that's how many roads you can have. That's the density of roads you can have before you start to see an impact on the wetland in terms of water quality. So that is something that we could use. Um, and then I just want to show you again that you can use the WFI or the WMI in the same way to look at um, how they're related to, to road density. So I hope I've convinced you it's a really uh, quick trip through, through the development and use of this, but uh, I think these kind of indices are really important for us to be tracking how wetlands change. Um, and so road density is a very useful indicator of the human disturbance even in the primarily forested watersheds, like in Georgian Bay. And these indices, the WQI, WMI, and the WFI are related to, to road density. 
Uh, most of the wetlands in Georgian Bay are still currently in excellent condition, but they are still showing some signs of degradation. Partly is because of road densities, increased recreational use, and partly a large part of it is because of, of uh, sustained low water levels. And so we are now in the process of developing indicators using the fish and the plants to look at um, if they can become indicators of, of water levels, low, 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 low water level stresses. And again, the, the threshold of 14 meters per hectare. So I want to uh, thank all the funders that, uh, that uh, supported us through the years, and in particular, all the wonderful students that did all the work uh, without whom I would not be able to give this presentation. So thank you. Okay, thanks. Okay, we have time for a question? Yeah. Over here. Yeah, oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, I'm going to hijack and talk a little bit. I'm from Thunder Bay. I was very intrigued by the quality of some of the, uh, the water indexes around there, given that, again, there was a lot of agriculture and land use. Does that tie into forestry and mining impacts? And what should be high density of roads? Is that something that you could look at? Um, well, in okay, Lake Superior, you always have to talk about U.S. versus Canadian. Right. So there happens to be very few wetlands in Canada on the Canadian side. So most of what you're seeing there is actually a reflection of, yeah, the Wisconsin and um, Minnesota okay. wetlands. Uh, but yeah, there are some, uh, there are, uh, in Lake Superior, for the Canadian side, it's more recreational because a lot of the cottages, um, for instance, there are trailer parks that will build around wetlands, and then when water levels went down, they try to, you know, just yeah, just go right into them and and damage them that way. So, in reflection, do you think it was worth spending all that money on cutes? It's <laughs> not a good question to ask me. <laughs> Um, we learned a lot from it, and um, I, think, I think that it brought people's, uh, I mean, it certainly focused attention on the importance of a wetland, and so from that perspective, it is very good. But I think that some of the more, some of the other strategies, such as creating dike cells or something within the wetland that could, could address some of the hydrological issues might have might have given us better, um, you know, a better result. But I think that as long as we don't have something in the wetland that would change the 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 water flow, um, and you, it, as long as we don't build up something that would prevent the water from just rushing through the wetland, I don't think it will happen. Yes. There are a lot of young scientists in the room, and the value of the long-term effort and the return, the addiction you have to future, that <laughs> yeah. you, as you called it, the return visit component. Could you just give them some thoughts on sticking with the game and the importance of advocacy for long-term data sets? Yeah, it's, it's really, really important. Uh, I mean, every five or 10 years, the government is supposed to report on it. And uh, if you don't have, if you're not sticking to it, if you don't go back and, you know, a lot of times we're, we're, we're continuing the work because we know this has to be reported on. And so very often they'll come to us because they know we still have that information. But I think, you know, that's the one thing that uh, it's, it's not sexy and it's, you know, very boring. But if you, without that data, you may as well not even do the restoration because you'll never learn from it. We found out so much information from that monitoring and uh, you know the plus is that you get to publish on it too. But that's an aside really. But yes, it's, that's one of the most important things for sure. Okay, thanks. We will move for the next speaker.